Welcome back, everyone, to another uh, interview on the Ludini Rock and Roll Circus. Today I'm speaking with uh, Xander Demos. Xander is one of today's premier shred metal guitarists. He's based out of the Pittsburgh area. Uh, he currently fronts his own band, Xander Demos Band, and has performed as a member of the National Tribute Act, James Rivera's Sabbath Judah Sabbath, as well as playing in Rivera's solo band and the Pittsburgh cover band Raised on Radio. Xander performs in an excess of 100 times a year, and he's active in recording collaborations with artists from all over the world. Xander plays guitars from Sir, McNaught, Brian Moore, and Conklin, with whom he has endorsement deals. Uh, His endorsement from these uh, guitar companies is a testament to his impressive skills and deep commitment to playing the best guitars in the world, and I would say a deep commitment to the guitar in general. So, uh, hey, well, welcome, Xander. How are you, buddy? I'm doing good. How about yourself, Liz? Real good, man. So, um, you you are this, like, uh, dy- dy- very dynamic, very uh, uh, accomplished uh, guitarist. How did you get started playing the guitar, man? MTV, back in the day, when MTV actually uh, played music. Okay. For the most part. Yeah, I mean... Not too, not too scientific, really, but that's how it happened. Uh, did, did you, like, seek out a, a guitar teacher or something? Or are you self-taught? Or? Um, more, you know, I, I actually started being self-taught, and I fucked so terribly that it was highly advised that I go ahead and, uh, um, <laughs> you know, get a teacher. So I did, and it did, I did pay off. Um, I ended up with a couple of good teachers, and I actually ended up with some teachers that were... Uh, really well known in the area, and uh, we're actually doing some stuff on more of a national level. Uh, Dallas Perkins was one of my guitar teachers. He was Paul Gilbert's roommate, actually, at the GIT back in, oh, the, okay. back in the mid 80s, yeah. So there was a little bit of um, cash aid of what he had to offer, you know? Yeah. Cool. Um, so, um, who were your heroes at that time? At that time, um, I was re- heavily influenced by. By the AOR guys, um, Brad Gillis and uh, Eddie Van Halen, Neil Sean, Tom Schultz, like that whole crew. And then they came along and screwed that up for everybody. And uh, <laughs> then I became a big Ingve fan, and uh, like a lot of people did. And um, uh, you know, really respected his work. Really, really loved what he had to offer and stuff. And uh, however, um, the, my songwriting style, like you know, when it came down to not just like, you know, copying, you know, the way people play and stuff, but like an actual attempt at songwriting. Uh, I realized I was more of an AOR guy, you know, like really, really into those, um, into those types of players. Uh, you know, still like, like Tom Schultz, but basically, you know, think of Tom Schultz and Ingve having a child, you know. Um, okay. I wanted, I wanted that type of, um, that type of characteristic. And uh, I think I, I kind of saw a lot of that as the 80s came to a close and the 90s rolled in, you know, like the shrapnel guys were getting really big at the time, you know, and um, so that's what I was really into. Uh, so, I, you know, I started changing that up, and then when guitar playing became not cool in the 90s, um, <laughs> I, uh, I started following more um, more along the lines of, like, jazz and stuff like that, like, you know, fusion players, like Alan Holdsworth and, um, you know, Sean Lane, who was, you know, a rock fusion player and stuff. Pretty cool stuff. I mean, I mean, I, I like the I, I like the fact that I had gone through a lot of different, um, like a lot of like a different cycles in uh, in my in my learning back then. You know, yeah. because it always it always managed to like uh, challenge me and stuff. And then you know, once you're 20 years into it, you're you're saying to yourself, wow, you know, I hear I got this um here's a song that has kind of like a blues feel to it. But I'm going to put like this really catchy AOR, Neil Sonish type of thing on it, you know? And you just find all kinds of different textures and colors and stuff um, while playing like that. So I, uh, I still to this day, I believe in that whole dynamic of playing, um, you know, with that, with that same attitude like, okay, I'm not going to just, if I'm playing metal, maybe I might want, you know, want to reach to a place where like, you know, Alex Skolnick, uh, it goes so often, you know, and he has like all these really cool fusion lines that he adds to, um, you know, to these these songs and stuff. So it's 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 always going to be a matter of mixing stuff up like that for me. Um. So okay. So, so were, were at this through this period, 
were you mm-hmm. primarily playing like in cover bands, or have you always sort of had your own band, or like uh, how did because you talk about songwriting a, and stuff? Yeah, I've always been a fan of originals and, and, and writing my own stuff. Um, mm-hmm. You know, cover bands were great, and playing covers was really cool. But I never really wanted to do that, like for, for it to be my my quote unquote gig. You know, I mean, it's a way to make some cash. Yeah, it's really cool. You know, and I mean, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna disparage anybody that does that. I would never do that. You know, but right. I always preferred the, you know, the creative outlet a little bit more, um, just so I can, so I can like, you know, flex a little bit. Yeah. You know, I mean, I guess, you know, somebody says, oh, dude, you have to play this, this dark and solo, just like it is on the record. No, I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I understand. I got, I got you on that. What is the state of metal now, and like this type of guitar work? I mean, it's, it just seems to me like there's a definite, like I mean, it's a niche market, but there's definitely people that really want to hear people tearing mm-hmm. up on the guitar. Yeah, there is. I mean, and I think that it's, um, I mean, it's, it, I think this for metal and all that kind of stuff is always going to be in a state of flux ever since the age of the internet. Because you just never know what's going to, um, you know, what people are going to be into a year or two from now. Like, I would have never thought in a million years that I would join a metal band in 2000 or 2001 because I just thought everything that was that was out was like the new metal stuff. And I just really couldn't take, you know, a lot of that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't listen to that all the time. And um, I, I definitely couldn't play it because it was just, you know, downtrodden and clunky, you know, uh, riffs and all that kind of stuff, and some of, those, some of those riffs were really cool and really catchy. But you know, they were just like you know, they 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 play their guitars down past the balls, and you know, <laughs> they, they 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 couldn't they couldn't do like really cool trickery and stuff like that. And I just thought to myself, you know what? I just I just I'm not into this right now. I don't disparage anybody that's into it. I just I can't see myself, you know, playing. And then I I was really tight with a guy back then who was kind of like my guitar tech, and he was so into that type of music. And anything that I played that was my like 80s driven, he was like, oh, dude, that stuff, it's so out. It's never coming back. <laughs> and, a year, and a year later, it came back. You know? Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, like, I mean, the sort of, like, just, I mean, the sort of uh, sort of, uh, a, a following that, like, a band like Steel Panther has, even, you know, it shows you that people are definitely still interested. You know, they'll listen to it. They're interested in it, you know. And these bands are all Steel Panther had again, a comedic, they, they had a comedic twist on everything, and, and it does it does make a difference. I think that's why the darkness had some success in the early 2000s because they added a comedic twist to it. But once they started taking themselves seriously, people were like, oh, dude, you know, we thought you guys were like a parody band, but they, you know, they were actually really good. I mean, that singer was phenomenal. He had a phenomenal voice. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I love the darkness. They're a great band. Yeah. They were definitely really good, you know? And, I mean, I just think that some people had, like, the wrong idea. And I think that, you know, I mean, it's okay if Bon Jovi comes out with a brand new album of, you know, hair metal, but if some some brand new band does it, all of a sudden they're, if they kind of get, like, scolded. And I just thought to myself, wow, that's so weird. It's so hypocritical. So you so, still think, you still see it as that way now, or do you feel, feel like it's more a little more open? I think it's a little bit more open, you know. I yeah. mean, I, um, you know, I think there's an acceptance among, you know, the rock and metal community. I think that sometimes, you know, people, they are um, a little bit quick to judge. You know, they're a little bit quick to say, oh, that sounds like this, and I want to hear something fresh and new. And then, I mean, I've been on tours and stuff like that and played festivals, and rock festivals with hair metal bands and progressive metal bands, and they say, no, we like bands that keep it real. And I might play one of my originals, and, and all of a sudden they're like, they're like, wait a second. This, you know, here, here's a song that sounds, it goes back to those days when music was cool and music was on MTV and stuff. And, I, and they would come up to me and ask me about the song, is it a cover or is it a, is it a, is it a cover of a progressive band? Is it a cover of some late eighties, early nineties hair metal band? I'm like, no, it's my song. I wrote it. <laughs> In fact, I wrote it three years ago. And they're like, wow, are you serious? You know? And you know, some people are like, thanks for keeping the spark alive. You know, others are like, wow, that's kind of, you know, really, you know, interesting sounding. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you know, if you think about it, Xander, like everything, that was old becomes new again. I mean, I remember, sure. I remember in the '80s, you know, you had like a little bit of a uh, rockabilly revival with the Stray Cats, 
And uh, mm-hmm. you know, so you know, and then people, and then the, you know, people were listening to them, and a lot of bands were like remaking songs from the '60s, uh, in mm-hmm. the '80s, and stuff like that. So I mean, I can't, I, you know, you know, I, I think that you know, you definitely, there's definitely room on the uh, on the great landscape here of music that we have today for for music that has that vibe, you know, yeah, for sure. I, mean, I, I completely, I completely agree. So, so let's talk a little bit about your music now. How many? Now you have two CDs out with your band. Uh, no, I actually no, I, have, um, <laughs> okay, I, I, yeah, I have one as a solo artist, just, you know, simply Xander Demas, and then it's called Guitarcadia. And then I okay. released with the Xander Demas band uh, one track, which was um, Dancing Through Daggers. Oh, I got gotcha. you. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. So that was just the one track. I got gotcha, you, man. Mm-hmm. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, so tell me about track. Xander. So tell me about the Xander Demos band. Well, as of right now, it's on a hiatus. Um, we okay. changed the name. You know, the guys in the band at the time really wanted to kind of get away from supporting a solo act. Um, they wanted to be more band oriented, and I didn't have a problem with that at all. Okay. Um, uh, they, you know, sometimes so I think a couple of them went about it the wrong way, but that's a story for another day. <laughs> okay. Um, Talk about that did, off uh, <laughs> yeah, That's okay. But we did change the name, and we started to get out there and you know do some stuff. Um, but I just think that, you know, a lot of the people that I surrounded myself with were unbelievably talented and unbelievably committed to other things, <laughs> you know. Yeah, okay. Um, one, guy, one guy was in another band. The other guy, I mean, he just, you know, he's a family man. And, I mean, I, I completely support that. And, you know, I had talked to a few people about, they had said, dude, you know, you're in your 40s and you're starting to make some noise out there in the music world. You know, you're kind of a latecomer, but that's okay. Just go get a bunch of kids that don't have a whole lot going on and have them support you, you know, and that was a great idea on paper, but trying to find people that were committed and that could, you know, you know, it was always one person that was shy of, you know, like this guy's a great player, but he's not up to the caliber of, you know, like the other two guys in the band or the other three guys in the band. And, right. um, and, and, and they kind of came out in their attitude a little bit and I was just like, oh man. So in 2015, here we're in right now, I'm taking time off to record album number two. And, you know, along with that Queen, uh, the Queen track with Robert Sweet, you know, to do some other tracks for some, you know, hopefully for some people. But I'm not obviously throwing in the towel at all. Um, I'm just, I, I just really need a year to kind of like, uh, uh, you know, kind of gather my thoughts again and, um, you know, rebuild the studio and uh, just, you know, have a whole brand new approach on stuff. Like I haven't bought a guitar in about, you know, almost a year, which is kind of freakish for me. Oh my God, um, that's like a weird, yeah. like some kind of sin. <laughs> I know it is, but in all honesty, you know what? With the endorsements I have, I, it's very, it's very unlikely that I would probably run out and buy, you know, a, another guitar anytime soon. It's, it's, uh, you know, Conklin and, and McNaught, they treat me like gold. You know. What okay, I mean? that's for, what I wanted to ask you about. You, that's what I want to ask you about is the, this mm-hmm. McNaught signature guitar. Now, mm-hmm. how, how does that how does that come about? Your own signature um, guitar. That's amazing. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it was definitely an honor. Dave McNaught, let me uh, tell you a little story about Mr. McNaught. Him and I go, we go way back. And when I say way back, I mean, I didn't really know him. I've never met him face-to-face. I never shook his hand. But way back in the day, there was a guy who had a famous guitar site called Ed Roman Guitars. And um, uh-huh, yeah. he was... Part of them. Yeah, he was very yeah because he was very well known and in some in some senses not very well liked, but he was very he kind of told it like it was and stuff and he essentially gave Dave McNaught his um, sort of not a, not a start but he kind of from what I understand I think he funded his company in the very beginning you know part of that uh, part of that deal was that some of these guitars that Ed Roman had come up with. Um, you know, I think Dave McNaught was building. And, I mean, now some of this stuff is rumors, and I don't know how much of it is all true, and I don't really, you know, chase Dave down for all the answers because it's not cool to, you know, to ask him stuff like that. Um, so what I, from what I understand, you know, he was doing pretty good for about three years. I fell in love with his guitars, you know, back in the late 90s, and I was looking at them on the web. And, you know, websites back then weren't as sexy as they are now. Everyone knows that. Okay. And, um you know, but I was just like drooling over these pictures. And back then, I was the kind of guy that would buy an Ibanez or an ESP or a Jackson for like, you know, $800 and sink maybe like 500 into it and make it perfect, you know, the way I wanted it. And, <laughs> right, you know, yeah, paying, a lot of that. <laughs> you know what I mean? But paying, yep. paying anything over two grand for a guitar was so foreign to me. So one day I walked into a local music store here in Pittsburgh, 
on um, these pianos and stuff. And they had a Brian Moore MC1 on the wall. And I played it, and I, it changed me forever. From that moment on, I was like, oh, dude, you know, I'm starting to make better money in my career. Uh, I think it's time to stop buying these stupid, you know, knockoff guitars. And there's nothing wrong with ESPs and Ibanez. Don't get me wrong. I said they make a fine instrument. But I was really enchanted by these amazing figured woods and these tones and all that stuff. And that's, that became more important to me. You know what I mean? So I would rather have one badass guitar than, like, four mediocre guitars. You know? And oh, I, did, I got you. You know what I mean? So over time, mm-hmm. I just started to build a collection up, and you know, I finally got to a point where, you know, I have a couple of Sirs that I'm completely happy with. I have, um, uh, I have one Conklin that's completely badass, and I have another one that should be delivered to me in about a month. Um, and I have, uh, you know, I have uh, three McNaught guitars, including a very rare uh, Tempest, um, which was like the controversial model that Dave was building at the time because he was Ed Roman was sued over it, and there was like this three-way lawsuit that was just really kind of crazy. But, okay. Um, but everyone in the since passed away, I mean, there's no, like a lot of the lawsuit stuff is now, like, you know, dissolved and, um, you know, but that, you know, I have one of those guitars and I keep it in my quote-unquote vault, which I don't play it anymore because of the rarity of it, but my signature guitars, getting to that, how that all happened, he and I were um, emailing each other uh, back in um, 2006, and um, I said to him, I said, Dave, look, I know, you know, I always bust your balls about you know, getting me, like, one of those Tempest guitars, I said, but, um, you know, I know there's only, like, a handful, like, 20 or 30 of them floating around out there, and a lot of people are asking a premium price for them. I said, but if you don't mind, if you happen to get a line on one, would you please, like, let me know so I can buy it? And he stopped me right in my tracks, and he said, listen, dude, he's like, those guitars I built back then, I wasn't crazy about. He's like, let me build you one now. I'll build you what you want. And I was like, wow. You know, and he did, and it was phenomenal. I got it, like, about two and a half years later. This was very expensive, so it took a while to pay for it. And um, and after I got that, he said, listen, I'd like to talk to you about, you know, making you an endorsing artist. And I said, that's fantastic. You know, he put me on his website, and then about a year later, I went to him and I said, you know, I'm, I'm talking to a company about possibly doing a signature guitar for me, but I don't really care for the company I'm talking to. And he said, screw them, I'll do it. And I was like, really? And he, he told me, and I mean, this was like an amazing compliment. He goes, dude, I have three favorite guitar players in this world. Randy Rhodes, Paul Gilbert, and you. He's oh, like, wow. And, yeah, and it was a great compliment from a guy like Dave, who's also an amazing player. And um, and so he so he said, I'll build your signature guitar. What do you want? I started sending him some pros, some designs. I even sent him a guitar I wanted him to base it off of, um, you know, like some, some like the cutaways and the sculptings and stuff like that. And he did, and that's where we, we are today. So he's actually taken orders for about, I think, half a dozen, you know, anywhere from like six strings to eight strings and stuff. And... I, personally, I have a six string and I have a seven string. So I have the very first seven, the very first six that he built. And here's the coolest part about that: both these signature guitars, which are like only five feet away from me right now in my studio. Um, <laughs> both, both of those signature guitars, um, the, the quilted maple tops on top of them is the same piece of wood. He actually saved it because the first one I got delivered in August of 2012 was the seven string, and then two years later he delivered the six string to me in August of 2014. And they're they're identical pieces of wood. It's so cool. The figuring on it, you can actually see that it was the same piece that it was cut from. So well, that's, right. like, that's very cool. Yeah, yeah it's, that, it that's is really cool. Sweet. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he actually saved that for me. He even said he's like, you know, I'm, I've got a backlog of guitars, as you know, you know, my backlog is like a year. Sometimes the delivery is only 18 months out. And I was totally fine with that. I was just like, you know, it's you David, know, don't sweat it. I mean. Uh, I have other guitars. I'm looking forward to getting, you know, to getting into other signature guitar. Uh, so right now, like I've, you know, even though I've been taking a little bit of a break from it, I have to actually do some stuff for him, like a video and stuff like that of the guitars, and you know, like a little bit of a demo and song and dance, and say, hey, this is, you know, Xander Dinas. This is uh, the X- XD series uh, signature guitars and stuff. And and I've been kind of silent all year because I've been working a lot, and the you know, XDB sort of went by the wayside. So. Um, you know, kind of excited to do some of this stuff again, you know, because yeah. I haven't, I haven't in a few months. I've been working very hard and, uh, you know, trying to buy a house and stuff like that. So I've been uh, really preoccupied. <laughs> but now it's time to get, it's time to get reacquainted with the instrument here, you know. Yeah, of course. I mean, with us guitar players, like it's always like if you start to get away from that stuff like that, you start to kind of feel like something's missing. Like you know, like you know, mm-hmm. when you kind of you start to feel like you're forgetting who you are as a person, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Because you start to get, 
stray from the guitar, you know. I, I feel you on that. Um, so you have, um, in addition to, like, your, your band and the, everything you've been doing, you've been on some cool compilation um, CDs uh, over the years. Yeah. Uh, what's, uh, can you tell me a little bit about the Queen tribute? And I'd like to talk about the UFC Rocks shows. Well, the UFC Rock thing is uh, is brand new, and I don't I don't know if it's even out yet. And the Queen okay. tribute is is definitely not out yet because there's still I only have a scratch track to send to Robert Sweet right oh, now. Oh, your your, man, yeah, your manager but, told me about this. I'm thinking it's out. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, I no, no, no. It's, it, no, it's, it, it's <laughs> totally cool. Yeah, it's it's going to be awesome though. When it's all said and done, man, it's going to be a great uh, tune because um, I love personally. I, I love the song. I got the ticket. You know what I mean? I got the ticket cool. the song I wanted. And um, I, you know, I wanted something very guitar oriented, so I went with I want it all. And um, so I started doing the scratch track stuff, and we're doing like the album version with all the cool little breaks and the, you know, the really badass guitar solo part on there and stuff. So I'm just gonna do. Um, and also, I gotta tell you, um, not a whole lot of people know about this. Um, I actually changed my guitar playing style over the past um, year. I, uh, I had this little epiphany about um, about last summer. And it was all due to that bastard Chris Broderick, who I love. Um, he's he's such an amazing guitar player, an amazing, you know, amazing inspirational guy. And I've met him a couple times. He's a hell of a nice guy too. And that little pick clip that he invented, man, that thing. Uh, I, I realized that while watching him play, right, he was doing okay. things a certain way, and I was just like, that's really cool. I wonder, like, I can't. I want to go ahead and buy some of those those pick clips. And I couldn't find the damn things anywhere. So I ended up finding them online, and I bought, like, about a dozen of them. And I started buying picks. Like, I've been a V-Picks endorser since the day Vinny and I met in 2008. He handed me a couple of picks, and he's been supplying me with picks ever since. Okay. So I, took one of his, I took one of his picks, and I sort of bastardized it a little bit. And um, I, I had it fit in there, and all of a sudden, I started playing, and I'm like, wait a second, I'm onto something here. This is a completely different style of playing because now I've got all my fingers free on my right hand, and I started doing all these really cool two, you know, two-handed things again. That I used to do back in the '80s. Uh, uh, really, you know, like Stanley Jordan and Jennifer Batten and people like that, and uh, and Jeff Watson even from my Night Ranger. He used to do the eight-finger stuff, but this yes. was a little bit different. This was more like what Broderick was doing before he joined Megadeth, where he was doing like a lot of the two-handed stuff. But I was doing a little bit different, like his playing style. He still holds his pick traditionally, okay? So if you imagine him, when you watch him play and you see him with his, you know, his pick clip around his thumb and he's, his pick, he still plays very traditional. If he does like a sweep arpeggio or something like that, it still looks the same. So I said, wait a second, let me try something different. And I did. Like I have very, I, I, I'm a computer programmer by trade. So, um, you know, I'm on the computer like, you know, eight hours a day, you know, typing and stuff like that. And I have like these very strong thumbs. So what I did was I had this pick clip, and I have my pick in there, and all of a sudden what I'm doing is all this little like three note per string scales that you see Paul Gilbert and Ingve making famous all through the years, I started doing with just my thumb. I was no longer holding the pick. So I would angle oh. the pick inside the pick clip a specific way, and I would like I would basically, it looks like I'm just strumming a guitar, but I'm not. Like I'm strumming an acoustic, I'm actually, like my thumb is just going really, really fast. Instead of my wrist going fast, it's just my thumb. Okay. So over this over this past year that I've taken off, I've been developing that technique, and I'm I think I still kind of suck at it. Before I would like do you know do some videos, like it's, 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 there's, there's, I'm I'm getting a lot cleaner and a lot better with it. But I think maybe in like another few months I'll be ready to do some videos and just say, hey, this is like a new this is like my new thing of playing. I mean, I'm not expecting you know to, to revolutionize guitar playing. I'm just saying that this is just something new that I started doing. Well, I'm I was going to say you need to throw a video up because. <laughs> I want to see what the hell you're doing. It sounds right. Cool. <laughs> is, is that now? Now, what does that do by just using the thumb? So you you what, have less tension in the wrist, or it just frees the hand up to do other it's, stuff. It, 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 it frees the hand up. So basically, like what I can do is I can go from like, um, I mean, you're a guitar player, so you know. So let's say, let's say you let's say you're doing a three note per string uh, thing on the first, the E string, the A string, and the and the D, like the the thickest strings, right? Right. So, so you go one two three one two three one two three with your thumb, and then once I get up to that, once I once I hit that G string, I might hit one note, and with my left hand, I might play three notes, and then with my free hand, play three notes on my right hand, and then and then do the same pattern like all the way up and on the remaining three strings. 
So it sounds okay. like kind of like a harp almost. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It sounds like something like like somebody playing a harp. And it's just it's, oh, wow. it's really cool because it almost has like a keyboard effect to it. And that's what David always complimented me about. He said, "Dude, he's like I listen to your playing and your legato. He's like you sound like a keyboard. You don't sound like a guitar player." And um, hmm. you know, and, and I always thought that was cool because that was a great compliment because a lot of legato players are influenced by keyboard keyboards and horns. You know, and um, like if you listen to Sean Lane, if you listen to Alan Holdsworth, they yeah. have a very horn like horn like sense to their guitar playing. And um, I mean, they're you know those guys will rip your freaking head off. You know, I mean when you're listening to them, I mean they're just you know, two of the most phenomenal players that I've ever seen. And, um, you know, I mean, I'm a big Sean Lane fan and, you know, a big Alan Holdsworth fan. So, I mean, just, you know, not, I mean, I don't, I would never consider myself in their class at all, but they basically, you know, to kind of see how they approach playing kind of, you know, you have that little kinship with them at that point. It's like, okay, I can see this. Like, I can see what they were, you know, what they were getting at with this or what they were trying to do with it or whatever, you know. And um, so it, it's, it's just another approach, you know what I mean? It's just another approach that you can apply to metal or rock or whatever you want to do. Sweet. That's, uh, yep. I mean, yeah, I'm really going to be interested. So when you get it together, you know, make sure you, like, send us some information so we can see your, to the videos. <laughs> oh, I, don't, I definitely <laughs> will. Cool. Yeah, I, like I said, I just feel like I kind of suck a little bit out of it right now. I need some more practice on it. Now, um, <laughs> Um, uh, Michael asked me to, to mention this, and I don't know since you're like, working on a new record now if you're still if you're still promoting this. But apparently, you guys have a cool version out of a remake of Boys of Summer. Yeah, that was on that was on Guitar Cadia. That actually goes back almost five years at this point because I recorded it in 2010 with my old cover band called Into the Arena. Okay. Yeah, very very cool stuff. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a difference between you know covers though and remaking something. You know that's. That, yeah, this, know, this was your own stamp yeah. on it, you know. Yeah, this, this was this was absolutely a um, a reimagining. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, uh, it wasn't just like a cover because, and, and I'll tell you where the influence came from. Uh, and this is this is this is no this is no crap here. Back in 1995, I had I probably I didn't play guitar for almost a year. I was into Euro dance music and techno stuff, and I didn't listen to you know. Uh, hard rock at all because you know grunge was king and I hated that stuff more than <laughs> more than words can say. I mean, I really did. I hated it. And you know, th- nowadays I listen to it and I'm like, okay, it's, to me it's more nostalgic now because it's like 20 years old. But and I don't I don't have like this disdain for it like I used to have. And I'm not ashamed to say that a lot of people are always like, oh, I've always been an open-minded musician. No, I have not been always open-minded. I've always been <laughs> speaking my mind, and that always got me in trouble. You know, and that's okay. okay. But but um, I was up in Toronto with my girlfriend at the time, and I um, I grabbed this album, and it was called Working Man, and it was a tribute to Rush. And I said, oh, this is kind of cool. I said, I haven't bought a rock album in God knows how long. I said, let me just go ahead and grab this one, because I like all the songs that are on there. There was, you know, Red Barchetta and all these classics from Rush. And then I'm looking at all the players on there. I'm like, oh, wait, Dream Theater's on there. Oh, wait, Queen Drake's on there. Oh, wait, Fate's Warning's on there. I'm like, man, all these cool bands are doing Rush songs. So... We drove up there, so on the way back, I'm listening to this, and all of a sudden, this cover of Analog Kid comes on, and I almost wrecked listening to it because I was so blown away. It was Billy Sheehan on bass, Michael Romeo from Symphony X on guitar, Mike Portner from Dream Theater on drums, Jack Russell from Great White, of all people, was a singer. Oh, and wow. I think, what's the, guy, what's the guy's name? Mike Pinella, I think, from Symphony X. He was a keyboard player. Okay. And him and, him and Michael Romeo, they do this trade-off solo in there that blew my doors off. I mean, I seriously like was swinging off the road because I was bumped. I was just, you know what I mean? And of course my girlfriend's yelling at me. She's like, what the hell are you doing? You're going to drive, you know? And so I get, we get back to Pittsburgh and um, I listen to this thing like 10 times in a row. And I'm like, I'm absolutely reinvigorated again. I grab my guitar. I dust it off. I change the strings. I, I, you know, reset the neck and I just started playing again. I wanted to play like Michael Romeo in the worst way. And that went, that that took me forward, you know, almost 15 years, like listening to that, you know, listening to that track. And when we did Boys of Summer, we did it as a sort of a tribute to the version of Analog Kid that's on The Working Man, where oh. me and my bass player are kind of doing like a tandem, like, you know, run and doing like a tapping thing together and stuff. And he was a big Billy Sheehan fan too. So, I mean, it was actually perfect. So, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's how Boys of Summer came out. It was like a backstory to that. Cool. So um, we talked about, you know, kind of what's what's going on in, in the state of metal and everything like that. Before we wrap up here, a couple of things I wanted to ask you. Uh, 
you know, you you're you're in the scene. You kind of have your ear to the ground. Who are the aside from yourself? <laughs> who are mm-hmm. the great up and coming uh, shred uh, guitarists? I, w- I would have to say, I mean, Guthrie Govan. He's very well respected and well known now. Um, a- Andy Wood is, a de- is definitely one of them. Um, he's actually playing, I think, for the last couple of now. He's, he's he's doing like a lot of great session stuff. He's he can play country, he can play metal, he can do anything. He's an amazing player. Those two guys for sure. Uh, yeah. I still as you know a very big fan of Chris Broderick as far as metal goes, because um, he's just so versatile. You know what I mean? And uh, and one thing that Guthrie Govan and, and Chris Broderick and Andy Wood all share is they share this 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 very sick and crazy versatility that not a lot of players possess. Uh, I mean, if you if you listen to them, they're like they can play almost anything, and they don't just you know they don't just play quote unquote shred. They they have other things that they have applied, to, so it makes it you know what I mean. Got, Guthrie Govan is like he's he's so amazing it's wrong or something. I mean it's like you no, watch his videos crazy, and like him crazy. he can play. I mean he could play just like 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 West Montgomery type jazz thing, yep. and then I mean yep. and it's totally authentic, not like a metal guy trying to imitate that. No 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 exactly. It, you can't yeah. close your eyes and you think it's one like George Benson or something, and then you, he switches and it could be just a sick shred, and then he can chicken pick, and I'm like better than Albert Lee. I mean, no, that right. guy is like, <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> he, I mean. Yeah, he's, he, he can do anything, and I mean, I, and there's another guy, his name is Rick Graham, who's a phenomenal player as well. Um, uh, he's got some cool videos out there, and I mean, his, you know, he almost sounds like a machine, though. You know what I mean? Like, he, he reminds me of Rusty Cooley, in a way. Okay. Rusty, he, he has that very machine-like uh, sound to his, um, his playing. I mean, some people say, well, you know, I like listening to Rusty, but he doesn't sound human. And, I mean, some people will take it as a compliment. They will take it as a compliment, but other people will say, well, yeah, I'd rather have somebody, you know, screw up once in a while, and he's just too clean, you know. And that's, I mean, if you watch me play, I mean, you'll, I, I screw up constantly on stage. I, I don't I don't give a holy crap either because this is rock and roll, you know. Right. What I happens? got you. I got you. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but anyway. So, um, so if people want to check you out and find out everything you're doing and get a hold of you and listen to your music, go ahead and plug anything you got out there right now. So right now, I mean, uh, ZanerDemus.com is still my website. Um, you can hit me up on uh, Facebook.com slash Zanerdemus Music. And um, I, I'm always, you know, online there. Uh, I'm always posting inappropriate stuff on Facebook. So <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Um, By the way, kids, Xander's very outspoken. So um, <laughs> he can't be easily offended <laughs> if you subscribe to his feed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't. If you're easily offended, please stay the hell away. <laughs> you know? You're, you're going to paint me like Howard Stern. You remember, remember, remember that movie where they said uh, the average Howard Stern listener listens to him one, hour, one and a half hours a day. What about the people that hate them? Oh, average average person that hates them, three hours a day. Yeah. Well, if they if they hate them, why do they listen to them? Yeah. You know, what I mean? it's like the same stuff, man. Oh man, oh gee, that's all good stuff. Hey, um, so um, any uh, oh, hey, I want to ask you one other thing before we go. Sure. Uh, any advice to to young guys coming up? You know, guys are just learning and stuff like that. Can you give give a little bit of uh, encouragement yeah, to, to the kids yeah, out there? Yeah, just. Yeah, just just quit and go back to school and don't bother being a guitar player. <laughs> no, I'm I'm, told, I'm so kidding. Um, and on that, on that note, we're done. Thank you. No, <laughs> no, no. My my advice to young guitar players is very simple. Um, you, if you're a young guitar player now, you are born in you were born into an era of over information and too much information and stuff. So my advice to that is, you know, <laughs> find your filter. You know what I mean. And yeah. uh, and for the love of God, please try to stay. You know, try to you know try to listen to not just one type of music because, you know, you have so much at your fingertips now. I mean, the record industry is a, is a disaster, and um, you know, to, to get your material out there, you have to you, you have to do take an indie route almost 100 percent of the time. Um, if you're lucky enough to land a gig, you know, to do something you know with another with a professional or a you know gigantic pop or rock star, that's awesome. But um, you know, as an up and coming player, I would always just encourage people to just, you know, uh, you know, to, to to leverage social media, but don't do it in a point where you're just forcing it down everyone's throat. Because, I mean, I've I've gotten in trouble with that. I've seen other guitar players that have gotten in trouble with that too. And I mean, and I say trouble, I don't mean like you know legal trouble. I mean just people are like, oh, they roll their eyes and like another one of his videos, I'm just gonna 
I'm just going to block him now. You know what I mean? You have to find a balance. You know, I mean, it's great to, you know, put out, you know, videos and stuff like that. But one thing I, I will say about the younger generation of players, the only thing I, I have a criticism about, I see so many people just to get YouTube hits that will do a cover song. You know what I mean? And they will, okay. and, and that cover song will go viral because it's a comfortable pair of shoes that people can put on and they're like, oh, man, here, check out this guy doing, you know, I don't know, some Backstreet Boys cover, but he metaled it up or something like that. And, again, and it goes viral and everyone goes nuts. And it, it's, okay, that's great that you got all these hits. But if you're that good, if you're that good to make that video go viral, holy crap, dude, go make something original. Make an, make an original instrumental. Make an original vocal tune. You know, I mean, it's, there's no, the, the rules have changed now. I mean, we're in the age of YouTube, in the age of the Internet, there's no way in holy hell that a band like Nirvana would have made it as big as they did back then. Do you, do you know what I mean? And I'm not, I'm not saying that to disparage Nirvana fans. I'm not saying that to disparage okay. the band itself. What I'm saying is grunge rose and fell very fast. Okay? Yeah. And it did that without the Internet. Okay, it did that while MTV was still playing music videos and while guys like Rolling Stone were performing fellatio on Kurt Cobain nightly. Um, you know what I mean? Because they were out there just saying, um, you know, whatever and whatever. And, you know, you will listen to what we say and we say this is cool and Journey sucks and that's it. But nowadays, yeah. I mean, you know, Journey rose back to, you know, fame again. Um, I mean, they play, you know, not stadiums, but they play like, you know, big, big arenas and stuff like that. And they perpetuated that. I mean, I think in 1997, if Journey was going to go out and do a tour, people would be like, "Yeah, I'm not going to go see them because I don't want my I don't want my friends to see me at that concert." You know <laughs> I don't mean? want anybody to know I went to the Journey concert. <laughs> exactly. You know what I mean? But nowadays, people can say, "I can either, you know, like you can either choose to watch Seems Like Smells Like Teen Spirit on MTV, right? Or, you know, if you didn't like that, then you had to wait for something else to come on now." With, I mean, what I call the ADD generation, which all of us are in. I mean, anybody right. who is on social media is the ADD generation. Somebody might say, oh, here's the first four chords of Smells Like Teen Spirit. I'm just going to go ahead and click off of this, and I'm going to watch Jet City Woman video over and over and over again until I puke. You don't have that <laughs> option. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But you have options. So as a, as a younger musician coming up, you know, keep in mind that you have that luxury of options, and it's a, it's a huge thing. And it's, um, I mean, that, there, there you go. I mean, again, I'm very outspoken about that. And some people might say, wow, that's Xander guy's a dick. Why would he say something <laughs> like that about Nirvana? But, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying it just about them. I'm saying it about, the, I mean, back in the 80s, we, there was no Internet, and we shoved uh, poison down everybody's throats. Right. No, no, no. I, I, understand, I understand what you're saying. And nowadays it's like anybody can, you know, you've got like a couple of seconds <laughs> or the kids switch to the next thing, and if and if it's a, a cover of a song they know, it's just you know you know you you're dealing with the attention thing. Absolutely, you know it, it's right. tough. It's you know, so you've got to find a, a new way. You've got to sort of you know you got to be a little better, maybe you know. Yeah, I mean it, you know it's a matter of being you know a little bit better, but at the same time, I mean you know look at that guy, look at Gautier, you know that some someone I used to know that song. Oh yeah. He did that song for what, a hundred dollars? Okay. And he released yeah. it in Australia and then it went it went worldwide. I mean, come on. I mean, if he can do that, I think that many people can do that. I mean that I think that's a very catchy song, you know. And um he basically put his middle finger up at any record industry and said, Oh, I released this myself and you know, I shall reap all of the benefits of it. I mean I think it's awesome. Wow. You know? Yeah, that, that's that's the great that's the great thing, and you're right. It's a catchy song, and that's the song has to be there, guys. You have to have, you know, and you I mean, have to have have, yeah, you gotta have a song. You gotta have a song. Yeah. Hey, Xander, it was great talking to you, man. And once again, Thank guys, xanderdemos dot com, and then you can just uh, find Xander on Twitter and Facebook. He's everywhere. YouTube. Hey, man, uh, you take care, man. All right, you enjoy the rest of your day. It was great talking to you. Same here, Lou. Thanks, thanks for the interview. Thanks for take care, buddy. I'll talk to you soon. All right. All right. Bye. Bye.